what I think the, the signal processing and communications pathway looks like. And uh, let's keep this super informal. I, I would love questions. I, I would love comments whenever you folks have anything. I, I so uh, it's a funny story. Uh, I'll also introduce myself in a second. But uh, I remember when I was a, a new grad student. And uh, so I, had, I was in the University of Wisconsin. Uh, which is the polar opposite of here, right? Uh, yeah, I'm like, when hell freezes over. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so I was at the University of Wisconsin, and uh, I I'd, I'd, I was in the ECE department, like you folks are. And uh, my granddad, who was uh, who was an engineer in his time, and he he uh, he built his own ham radio and things like that. So he was one of those uh, fancy hands-on people. And he asked me to send me uh, send him a picture of my lab, right? And uh, so I worked in signal processing. So my lab was essentially my laptop and a notepad. So he was so disappointed. I mean, he was, he was like, where are the big whizzing machines? And where's the arcs of current flowing through and things like that, right? So uh, which is why I want to hear about what you folks think when you hear signal processing and communications. It's a slightly uh, different field, which makes it also fun. Uh, and than the, the traditional EE stuff. But you will see that uh, it's very relevant to most of the things that, as electrical engineers, we care about. OK, with that out of the way, uh, I'm Gotham Dasarathi. Uh, people have taken classes with me. I don't think I see any familiar faces. They know this slide. Uh, Gotham is pronounced as in Batman, Gotham City. right? And Dasarathi is like the car Maserati. So that's how you pronounce my name. Uh, I'm at. Uh, the Goldwater Center, uh, which is right here in the third floor. Uh, please feel free to shoot me an email if you would like to discuss anything. I have actually had a bunch of people follow up after the last time I did the Pathway Seminar, and we had fun conversations, and uh, they're doing some cool stuff. OK, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. Right, And uh, like I said, signal processing and communications is, is a is a field of electrical engineering that's slightly different from what uh, the bulk of people think about it about EE in general and uh, I, I don't want to get into too much of a lecture mode but then the the idea is that signals are anything that anything that carries information so for instance I'm talking to you that's a signal because I'm transmitting information to you so anything that carries information uh, information is called a signal and signal processing essentially is about how, how you process these uh, information carriers in order to do something useful with it, right? So very simple definition. And uh, so you can imagine uh, j just how useful these things are. For instance, uh, 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 what I have here is an example of a, of a traditional signal processing system, which is a pacemaker. So I don't know if people are familiar with this, but essentially uh, some people's hearts just don't fire at the right rate all the time. So uh, what, uh, what, some, what was built was a device that can read your heart signal. So this is called the ECG signal, right? So it's a signal because it tells you how, how your heart's are, heart is beating. And it reads that signal, and then it figures out if there is a lack of uh, the pulse rate or the, the, the frequency of beats. And then it kind of jolts your heart into action. Right? Like, so this is a stereotypical way of thinking about signal processing. You get some information from the environment. Uh, you understand what it's supposed to be. And then you sometimes maybe intervene, or you process and then intervene. Right? So, uh, so are people familiar with a pacemaker? Right? I mean, this is kind of like a. Uh, well-known device. And uh, as you can see, it's very critical for several people. So we are very thankful for the existence of pacemakers, right? So, so uh, the, the, the story goes that uh, traditionally, uh, when signal processing first started out, uh, it started out because of a bunch of musicians. So who here is into music, into creating music? OK. Cool. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Uh, what do you play? Or do you play something? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I play a few. I play flute, uh, saxophone, uh, uh, guitar. OK, very good. What, what other instruments do we have? Do, do, we, do you have an instrument? You, you're into music in that you're, you would like to hear him play? <laughs> That's cool. I, I would, too. OK. I, anybody else? Uh, I play double bass. Double bass. Come on, really? OK, that's very cool. OK. So uh, anybody else? Keyboards. Keyboards, OK. So. Um, 
So it, it turned out that uh, what people figured out was you can actually take, uh, I don't know, first the vibrating strings and then trans uh, transform it into an electric signal so that you're not just uh, constrained by listening to the string vibrate in front of the room. You can actually make it, you can amplify it, you can increase the sound, and you can also transform the sound, right? Like so when you have the, the really, the, the, the double bass and you have, uh, shredding and things like that. What's happening is that you're not really listening to what the strings are doing, but you're also like listening to something that a processor is sitting on top of it and doing. And keyboards, of course, uh, they're built in with all sorts of fancy gizmos to make it sound much better than what you, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I'm sure you're good. But so, uh, so this is how it started. Uh, in fact, some of my uh, advisors were, are, uh, are rock musicians. So uh, there's another funny story. I, I got my first job, so essentially as a, uh, as a uh, grad student, because in my first class to my advisor, so my advisor was teaching this graduate level class, so I wore an Iron Maiden t-shirt. So <laughs> please, please tell me someone knows Iron Maiden. Okay, thank you. Oh my god. So uh, the, the, the gap between me and my students are rapidly increasing, and I'm like, kind of getting scared. I need to, anyway. So, so I wore an Iron Maiden t-shirt, and it turns out that he was a big metal head, and that's how we started talking. I and mean, of course, he, he thought that I was uh, decent at my class. That's why he hired me. But we still, we began talking because of Iron Maiden. So, so these guys, they got into signal processing because they understood that uh, you need to be able to transform these signals in order to create good music, right? And uh, so the synthesizers and the amplifiers were, uh, in some sense, the, the most OG uh, motivation for dealing with signals and working with them. And it also was very motivating because these guys cared about creating good music, right? So digital audio is uh, how it started. And then we, uh, we move to kind of harder problems where it's no longer just audio, uh, you now have video. Everybody has a, a supercomputer in their pocket right now, right, which can uh, stream extremely high quality video and you can, you can watch it. Uh, in fact, uh, I know some people who have, uh, who have just uh, uh, done away with their TVs and internet and just do everything on their iPhone and iPad, right, which is, uh, which is kind of insane. Um, I, uh, this, I, this is turning out to be uh, uh, a walk down memory lane. So uh, it used to be that uh, it used to be that uh, there was a a threshold when above which you would hear your professor say things like, "In my day, right? Uh, I remember when there was no iPhone. Isn't that wild? Even though even though I can't imagine what my life would be like without an, without a smartphone right now." I totally remember what it was like without an iPhone. I was, uh, so, so these things are, uh, are progressing really fast. Uh, there used to be a time when uh, you couldn't quite uh, get a half decent picture on a phone, but now you can get a full, full length and high quality streaming, streaming videos on the phone. Right? And uh, in your uh, signal processing classes, you would study like, how it is that you can take uh, signals that are essentially uh, images that are captured by a camera and then like transform them using the stuff that you learn in these classes in order to make it look as good on your phone, right? So, so you would study things like this, but really what you're going for is things like that, right? Where you want to be able to uh, create photorealistic images and things. Okay, so there are uh, also uh, more critical applications of signal processing. Uh, one of, uh, some of these are in uh, like br the brave new world in some sense is medical devices. And uh, me medical devices are essentially, uh, we are slowly transforming ourselves into cyborgs, right? Because we, we realize that there's some uh, fault in how our body works. There's some kind of uh, misfiring. So what we want to do is we want to intervene with electronics in order to be able to make it function better. So a hearing aid is a perfect example. So it turns out that uh, some people lose, it's not that the, the, the hearing nerves are damaged, but it's the hair that vibrates that is damaged, which is kind of uh, interesting. So, so essentially what, uh, what we're doing is we're able to intervene in the system where there's external sound and then your brain processing, we're able to implant a device that is able to kind of transform the signals into something that your brain can understand. And uh, so uh, ha have people here gotten an MRI scan? Anybody? Okay. So, how do you like it? It's weird. Okay, that's a, that's an understatement. I like it. Okay. Uh, so, how long did it take? I had two last week. Last week? 
Are you okay? <laughs> I, I'm serious. What, what happened? Was it a fracture or something? Yeah, it was a stress fracture. Oh man, a stress fracture. Okay. Take care. Uh, so you need to be healthy for, uh, for school. W what about you? Oh my God, okay. And how was that experience? It's pretty loud and cold. Pretty loud and cold, yeah, exactly. So if you've ever been in an MRI, you're essentially in a tube, right? Uh, uh, so it, depending on how lucky you are, you're either entirely inside a tube or you're just like partially inside a tube. And then uh, it's cold. Uh, you're being observed through, it, it's like a weird alien abduction dream, right? You're observed through a glass window and uh, there are people just looking at you and, uh, and the worst part is that it's crazy loud because there's this, essentially what, what's happening is there's a bunch of magnets that are moving around and it's really loud. So, so it, it's a very disorienting kind of thing to do, but it's critical because if you have a fracture or what, what happened to you? Are you okay? Oh. Um, it's kind of complex. I had a lumbar Oh, okay, okay. So, so anyway, so uh, the, the thing is that it's, it's, a, it's a critical uh, step in understanding how a patient is sort of uh, progressing or if what, what's wrong with the patient, like in order for diagnostics or prognostics and things like that. Um, I, had, uh, I had an MRI recently because I tore my ACL and uh, theoretically it should just be, uh, you go image my knee, right? But it turned out that, oh, you have to be in this tube for several hours before they can get a picture of what's going on. So uh, it turns out that uh, uh, inventions in signal processing is going to cut, cut down the MRI time by uh, 10x, essentially. So, so we have uh, now technologies that Siemens is licensing, licensing as of uh, like two years ago. So they've started licensing it. So now they're building it, baking it into their MRI machines, which will hopefully make uh, all our MRI experiences much better. So let's say 10 minutes instead of uh, three hours. So, so uh, the, the nice thing about this area is that uh, you take something very abstract, which is like, oh, signals are things that carry information and I'm going to process it in the computer. And then you can create real world impact, right? Like something that reaches people every day. So you get to geek out, you get to be uh, uh, engineering nerds or whatever, but then you also get to create real world impact. So that's medical devices. Here's something a little bit more uh, out there. Uh, Cochlear implants are sort of say, uh, similar to what we saw in the hearing aid, but uh, we are getting way more uh, cavalier with this stuff, if, if you will. Uh, so who here has heard about uh, Neuralink? Okay, do you want to tell us? Uh, it's, a, it's a chip that uh, Elon Musk plants in your brain. Okay, and I All, uh, that, that, that sentence right there yeah. is, is, is so troubling. A chip that Elon Musk plants in your brain, okay. Anyway, yeah, you're right, I'm just kidding, yeah, so okay. Um, Hopefully he doesn't do it, is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, so, so in some sense, I think the, the, the brain is the next big frontier. Like, I think space is going on, but the, we really don't understand anything about the brain. And the idea behind Neuralink, which is a uh, hypothetical so far, I mean, we are still kind of, they're still working on it. They, they have the, uh, the, the front of the line biomedical engineers working on this. But the idea is that uh, uh, Elon Musk came up with this idea that if, you, if the brain is just elect, uh, neurons communicating with each other electrically, you should be able to read it and then be able to understand what's going on, right? So essentially, uh, the idea is that you can implant a chip or uh, hopefully just wear a helmet, right? So that you can read the neuronal connections in your brain and see how they're firing to actually understand what's going on. So you don't have to say type, you can just look at your phone and uh, think a message and it'll just type the message. So that's the dream. And uh, uh, I, I'm not sure, <laughs> but, but it, maybe, maybe if uh, you conscientious folk wo folks work on this, I'll be a little bit more con uh, comfortable with something like that. But so this is definitely happening. We are uh, understanding more and more about the brain and we are getting better and better uh, with uh, electronics and processing and things like that so that you can actually, this dream will be a reality in, in, in a few years from now. So, so that's the cool sci-fi application. I mean, as uh, people here are familiar with Black Mirror, uh, so you should you should go watch the show if you if you aren't. And there's some crazy, scary things that happen if you do things like that. But 
But uh, this is the sci-fi application. But right now, there are also interesting medical applications where you can treat very hard to treat diseases like uh, Alzheimer's and things like that, uh, neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, you can treat it with what's called uh, deep brain simulation, where the idea is you, you plug into the person's brain, right? and uh, kind of stimulate it with uh, electrical impulses so that you can kind of get the brain back on track. So, so all of these things, the, the, the kind of underlying mechanism is very similar, which is that you have a bunch of signals that you want to first understand. And it's not like a human is able to understand these signals because they're very complex, very high dimensional, but you want to build devices that can understand these signals. So uh, a little bit of uh, just uh, more far afield, uh, signal processing is what's used when you uh, want to look at the radar images to figure out the weather. Uh, thankfully, uh, in Arizona, we don't have to care too much about it. It's either uh, you stay indoors for a few months uh, <laughs> or, or you can get out. But in Wisconsin, this is not the case. So I pulled this up uh, last time I did this talk and uh, the wind chill in Madison was close to minus 60, right? Uh, think about that for a second. Anyway. Uh, and then we had to go to math class when this happened. <laughs> this is crazy. And the math class was on a hill, so uh, all the, the freshmen would fall. It was great. We, this was our entertainment going to math class. So uh, yeah, so we, we use it to kind of process uh, radar images from satellites to understand things like weather, which has uh, everyday impact. Uh, and also, uh, we are uh, we can uh, scan underwater with what's called sonar, which is using sound signals. So it's not just sort of radar or uh, audio video signals. These are, uh, it's like a bat essentially. So it, it, makes, uh, it makes sounds and then it uh, measures what's coming back so that you can measure the, so you can kind of look underwater if you will. And uh, you're of course at the epicenter of the self-driving revolution. So uh, people here have seen the way more cars around. So, uh, so th this is uh, uh, not, not too many places in the world where they're actually testing it at this scale, right? So hopefully this will become a reality. Uh, or not, I mean, who, uh, who, who doesn't want a self-driving car? I think there's a good case to be made for no. Yeah, why, why don't you want a self-driving car? Well, I don't trust them. <laughs> okay, okay, that's, uh, well, so you, you're saying that you trust, yeah, you're saying you trust human beings? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, how many people do you see uh, texting while they're driving? It's, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I mean, anyway, we don't know, right? Uh, this is actually a, it's, it's becoming an interesting uh, techno-societal problem where uh, people are much more, uh, much more willing to grant leeways to our fellow flawed creatures as opposed to machines. So, uh, but, so, so there's actually a nice philosophical component to this. So how do you decide what's a, what's, what a self-driving car ought to do if it say, ha comes up with the so-called trolley problem, if you have seen The Good Place. But, so so the, uh, I don't just watch TV shows, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so, so you're at the epicenter of this revolution and the, the amount of signal processing that goes on to a self-driving car, even though it doesn't work yet, is, uh, is frankly amazing because they have a bunch of LIDARs. If you've seen these things up close, there's these uh, rotating little pillars on the side. So those are LIDARs. So they are taking in light signals and they are trying to build a map of what's around them. And then there's uh, cameras and then there's sort of radar, everything. So, so you're kind of sensing the whole environment and trying to make decisions based on that. Okay, so um, how are we doing on time? My watch died, okay. So, we, so I'm, I'm slowly gonna, uh, let's, let's think about this as a interactive session so that uh, by the end of it, we would have asked most of the questions, but I'll still have time for questions at the end of it, okay? So if you have any comments, you should just feel free to chime in. So the other uh, big application area that is uh, a whole brave new world is drones, right? Uh, of course, there are military applications, which are, uh, I don't know, it's a little scary, but there are also consumer applications, which seems to be actually happening now. There are people that are getting deliveries with, uh, uh, Amazon drones, and uh, so yeah. Anyway, the 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 idea is that you, if you have these autonomous kind of uh, three-dimensional navigation systems, can you control all of them and then read the signals that they're bringing in so that you can say do something like a delivery, right? So 
uh, drones are happening. And uh, so now the, I'll transition on to the communication side of things, where if you're, if you're measuring a bunch of signals and you want to process it, it's not that you're always measuring things where you can process it. Right? Like for instance, uh, let's say there is a drone that's kind of flying away and it wants to transmit some video to you. So this is a, a standard thing that people do, right? They take drone photography. These signals need to be communicated to your phone, for instance, or a, or a laptop. So communications are a uh, neat tie-in into signal processing. So we have to deal with how to communicate signals and then how to communicate them without errors. There's a whole bunch of things that you need to deal with. Okay, so communications are uh, a very integral part. Uh, in fact, uh, it used to be that 2020 was this scary, distant time in the future. People were making predictions about 2020. We are here. Where is my flying cars, man? <laughs> so what we do, we do have uh, hoverboards, which is like, uh, it's pretty cool. But 2020, uh, uh, so this, was, uh, uh, this is a little outdated, but the, but the predictions are kind of coming true in the sense that uh, 2020 is supposed to be the, the decade of the IoT, right? like the Internet of Things, where a whole bunch of devices are communicating with each other. You, have, you build in like, connectivity into random devices. So people have uh, fridges with Wi-Fi, refrigerators with Wi-Fi. I don't know why. Uh, uh, who has a smart speaker? OK. I, I, I question your choices in life. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> they're, they're pretty cool. I, I, uh, Someone gifted me a smart speaker. I sent it to someone else. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's a little scary. I, 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 heard, I read the story that uh, it, it was randomly recording people and, and uh, messaging these uh, conversations to other people. So anyway, uh, it's here to stay. So you're probably ahead of us. But uh, the smart speakers are here to stay. There are all these uh, connected devices. And uh, it, it makes sense, right? Because you, uh, you, you want to be able to kind of automate a bunch of things so that you don't have to worry about a whole bunch of, uh, say, for instance, I don't want to worry about how cold this corner is in my house. So I want my smart thermostat to kind of figure that out itself so that it can turn on the heat in that corner. So there is this trade-off between uh, uh, convenience and soul selling, if you will. But uh, we, are, we are working that out as society, right? Uh, so. So these are things that you would see uh, in, a, in any a single, pro a single processing communications program. Something that's uh, admittedly super unique to ASU is uh, the, the, the collaboration with the AME program, right? So people have heard of the arts media engineering program. Has anybody taken a class with them? Okay, you totally should. So uh, I have, a, I have a, a bunch of good friends there. So, so those folks, there's, uh, there are, uh, they're, they're an interesting bunch, right? There are uh, feminist philosophers, there are, there are quantum feminists, and, and also there are, there are uh, performance artists, there are musicians and dancers and uh, all these folks that are faculty there. And they use signal processing to enhance the next generation of uh, performance. So, so they have uh, interactive performance where the audience members are involved in the performance, so the people who are researching in that. And there's also uh, people who are uh, implanting a bunch of markers so that you can study how dancers move so that you can maybe teach it better to other people. So if you're interested in, uh, in performance, music, and things like that, so you can actually use your engineering chops to uh, improve that, that area in and of itself. Okay, so, so these are the the basic things that are kind of traditionally what, what was uh, thought to be signal processing and communications. Uh, we are, of course, in a, in a brave new world, uh, something much closer to my heart because this is what I do. Uh, people have heard of machine learning, uh, data science, AI, all this stuff. These are all buzzwords, right? Uh, you can call everything AI. I, I've started calling my calculator AI because, I mean, it can calculate, right? <laughs> so so uh, anyway, so the... So the, the way that I've been uh, phrasing this is that you, you, you get signals from the, from the environment, and then you process it with a computer, and then you make, you, you make decisions, right? So it turns out that, so, uh, let's take the example of an ECG, uh, sorry, uh, the pacemaker. So here, in order for me to decide when to input a signal that will save this person's life, I need to understand how the heart works, right? Like I need to understand that there's something going wrong so that I can program this chip to do this uh, intervening uh, electric jolt. 
But it turns out in several applications, we actually don't know the thing that we are actually monitoring. So, so for instance, you have to learn this thing from data. So you have to, like a child, uh, this, this device has to observe the environment and build models on its own so that you don't have to worry about how this thing works. So that's where uh, data science and machine learning comes, where you actually teach the device to learn from its observations, right? Like, a, like much like a child. So, so it turns out that uh, there is a significant need for these uh, uh, for people skilled in these areas. And as a SP Com person, you have a unique pathway into this. So, the the United States alone apparently faces a massive shortage. Uh, of people who, who need to be uh, well versed in data science but who don't have the skills. So you're in the right kind of place right now, right? And uh, it cuts across several disciplines, so this is in intrinsically multidisciplinary. Okay? And uh, I'm not going to go through uh, all this stuff. There's a whole bunch of applications to data science and machine learning. Um, anytime you get a uh, use Netflix or Amazon to watch a video, uh, then you, you're recommended uh, the next best movie based on an algorithm that's observing what you're doing and, how, and what people like you are doing so that it can recommend the best, next best thing to you, right? Disney Plus, not so much. Uh, not that they need to recommend everything is good, kind of, right? So, <laughs> but, but Netflix and Amazon have really good recommendation engines. Uh, uh, online advertising, as creepy as it is, uh, it uses data science and machine learning to get you the best uh, products that it thinks you like. Um, so I have now learned, uh, I'm married, so I have now learned that I shouldn't, so I, I first get the cool thing, uh, get my wife excited about it, and then tell her it was a Facebook ad. So <laughs> otherwise I, get, I, I don't get to buy this thing, right? Like, so it's, 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 it's uh, interesting how many, uh, great things that I've gotten from Facebook advertisements. It's, it's amazing. I, I love it. So <laughs> online, ads, uh, online ads are great. So these things, essentially, uh, you, will, you will learn how to build a recommendation system if you take the right kind of classes. So, so th these things are getting baked into uh, products as, as we speak. There are, uh, so there are consumer sides, right? But there's also, like I said, in, in medicine, I think, the, the next great frontier, like we said, was, uh, neuros is neuroscience, but also what's called personalized medicine. So uh, uh, the dream is that you could just walk into a, into a clinic and then get your DNA sequenced and then get a drug that will just work only for you, right? Because we, right now what we have is a fire hose. We just essentially build one uh, pill that will hopefully work for everybody, but there are side effects that don't work for everybody. So, uh, we, don't, we just don't have the ability to process all this data in an intelligent way so that we can create new pills. So uh, with the advances in, uh, in data science, the hope is that we can do this. So uh, personalized medicine, personalized learning, maybe uh, when you're learning, you can get uh, kind of a, a sidetrack where you get something that's entirely personalized to your learning style, your learning abilities and speed and all these things, right? and uh, pers personalized everything else. And analytics, you sport analytics now is almost entirely automated. You just have uh, people with personalities talking over it, but all the computation is done by uh, computers right now. Cool, any questions So about how all these things fit together before we move on to more brass tacks? Any comments? I've become better at, uh, at awkward silences, so I could keep going, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but I won't, I won't. <laughs> okay, so, so the, the, uh, the one thing that, I, I, before we move on, is that uh, signal processing and communications really can be thought about as uh, sensor data science, because in a traditional computer science department, uh, when they talk about data science, it's, they essentially enter, enter the problem after they get the data, right? But you folks, you also get to build the sensors that uh, generate the data. So you, you have a more intimate understanding of uh, where the data is coming from, how to actuate the sensor so that you get better data in order to do things like this. So, uh, so we have a bunch of uh, new, new ways to think about data science from an ECE, ECE department. Uh, okay, so uh, maybe this is something that you, you're really curious about, which is uh, career op opportunities. Uh, there are several employers who are known to recruit folks from uh, ASU ECE, so as the, the 
the usual suspects like Motorola, AD&T, Qualcomm, these are all communication companies uh, that, that want people who are, uh, who are skilled in communications, but also devices and uh, signal processing, right? So, so these kinds of companies. There's also uh, Lockheed Martin. These are more government contractors. Uh, LG, so, the, so I, I, I'm not going to read all of them, right? So there are a whole bunch of companies that hire people who are skilled at uh, taking, uh, uh, taking a, a, a combination of skills, which is uh, how do you build devices, how you use the signals that are generated, and then how do you process them in order to actuate things. So, so that's something that you will learn in an EE department. There's also a whole bunch of opportunities in the automotive industry because, uh, like I said, self-driving cars is a, a, a thing. But apart from that, your car is a supercomputer. Right? There are chips everywhere. Uh, this, there are decisions that are made for how, how, when you have to activate the ABS. Uh, which is another uh, Wisconsin thing that you folks don't need to worry about. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, you you have to. Uh, these things are all decided by the the, the ECU, the the computer that's sitting in the car, and uh, the government, of course, is very interested. Uh, so uh, if you're if you're into spycraft or if you're into uh, things like okay, so you want to uh, be proactive in terms of national security, signal processing is uh, one of the first fields that actually saturated all these departments in the government. And then universities, uh, you could become me. <laughs> no. But so uh, uh, there's a saying, right? Uh, if you can do, you do. If you can't, you teach. Uh, this is not true, right? Uh, in, in fact, people who are hired into uh, faculty jobs are actually researchers who do most of this work. I, I teach two hours a week, but most of the time I'm doing research. So if you're interested in the cutting edge, so you want to develop new algorithms, if you want to develop new devices that can actually be uh, in, in consumer products 10 years down the line, if you have the, that kind of vision, you, sh you should also consider getting into a university environment. And ASU has done very well in uh, uh, both, both recruiting people, but also in placing people in all these kinds of situations. Questions? OK. Uh, I should say this also. Because you can get into data science and machine learning, uh, uh, there's a whole other uh, area of jobs that opens up. Uh, the data scientist is apparently the sexiest job of the 21st century, uh, whatever that means. Uh, but but it's, it's from HBR, so it should be right. <laughs> but uh, so, so it turns out that uh, all these companies that are more from the internet age, which is, uh, uh, I guess, Skype, Facebook, YouTube, Google, uh, they're just uh, vacuuming up people who know anything that is related to signal processing, right? any kind of information processing. And uh, uh, I, I won't lie, the, the pay is very nice <laughs> in these companies, so, so that's, that's a really good uh, motivator. Uh, in fact, I, I, someone emailed me saying that uh, TikTok is hiring. No, I won't do that, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that some people get it. Okay, it's good. Anyway, so uh, TikTok is hiring data scientists, maybe if, if that's your jam. But uh, there's also, uh, from the consumers, these, these are all consumer-facing companies, but they're also sort of the back-end companies that are doing a more uh, big-scale work, right? Like, uh, so let's say ASU wants to figure out how to do its payroll. So they're going to outsource it to one of these companies, and they, they might use... Uh, uh, more, more modern techniques like data science to figure out what's the right way to uh, design workflows and things like that. So, so there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, other companies that are in the back end. You probably have handouts. If these things are not clear, I'm, like I said, always happy to talk about this. Uh, I have several friends who have uh, done uh, different tracks. So uh, I have contacts, but also more importantly, I have uh, perspective from these people. So I'm happy to get into any of these uh, tracks, if you will. Okay, so, so these are uh, career opportunities. Uh, then the, I should also talk a little bit about ASU opportunities. So ASU uh, is a massive school, if you haven't noticed. And uh, the, the, the nice thing is that this means that you have access to a, a whole bunch of people who are experts in several areas. So these are faculty that you might consider working with, taking classes with. Um, so the people in blue are women. We're trying to get more diversity in our department. But uh, we're doing very well compared to several other schools. And uh, so as you can see, the, the expertise is kind of uh, 
all over the place, which is nice because you get to, uh, uh, you get to learn about different things, right? So, so these are all folks that uh, do something vaguely related to signal processing and communications. Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk about courses, which is uh, something that you're gonna deal with immediately. So before I move on, do, do, do people have any questions? Tough crowd, no, I'm kidding. Okay, so, uh, so courses, so the, 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 the junior level courses are kind of the standard ways to enter into this area, which is uh, signals and systems one and two, where, you, where uh, we take what we spoke about today, which is uh, how do you take signals, how do you process them, and, and how do you deal with them. Uh, we, uh, w you will deal with that more formally. So one thing that you, get, you tend to lose track of when you're sitting in courses is the sort of big picture, right? And I want you folks, at least who, who, who are here, to constantly think about uh, the context in which you're learning these things. Because you're, uh, it's very easy to lose track, but these, this is, uh, trust me, when you're working out your Fourier transform or Fourier uh, coefficients, trust me that it's cool, right? So think, uh, tell yourself that, that what you're doing is actually uh, getting worked into systems as you speak, and that, that impacts people. Um, uh, 350 is random signal analysis. I, I have taught that class that's more about uh, it's uh, how do you deal with random signals? So everything uh, is actually not that predictable in the sense that uh, if I have a if I have my cell phone, uh, do people even know how this works? I feel like so you you I have a signal right now and there is a tower somewhere. How how do how does it come here? Right? It seems really crazy. So uh, it turns out that. Uh, the, the signal is, is good, it, it kind of permeates through stuff. It hits a bunch of walls, so you have, a, you have these bouncing signals, and when it arrives here, it's just a, a mishmash of a whole bunch of bounced off signals from walls, right? And uh, so it turns out that, it, because it depends on where I'm sitting, who's walking by, what door is open, and things like that, it's a random signal. So uh, 350 will teach you how to deal with these kind of randomness. And it turns out you can actually do a really good job, even though it appears very hard, it, you can do a very good job with this stuff. Okay, so uh, 203 and 350 are a uh, major building block, so you need this to do the kind of uh, uh, the advanced courses in, in this area, in this pathway. So, and then you have uh, some more elective courses that are senior level, so there's uh, DSP, which is uh, where you kind of uh, digitize a signal, so when you're dealing with a computer, you actually have just digital signals, so how do you deal with that stuff? And there's communication systems, which is again, how you communicate signals, and networks, which is for communicating between a bunch of devices, and real-time DSP is when you're doing it live. So when you're building a pacemaker, uh, it has to happen right there. It's not like you can go home and process it and come back, right? So, a, uh, uh, so this is a kind of uh, senior level courses that you will be taking in this pathway. Uh, of course, there are more graduate courses and master's courses. So this semester I'm teaching uh, 554, which is uh, the, the sort of graduate level version of the random signal analysis class. But there's a whole bunch of other classes. Uh, there, there's a, the word theory gets used a lot in this area, so that might be scary to some people. But it uh, turns out that, uh, thankfully, we are in an engineering department, so which means that even though we're understanding the mathematical foundations and the theoretical concepts behind this, they're all motivated by real-world examples. So we will constantly be making contact with, uh, in all these courses, we'll be making contact with uh, either through projects or through examples and homeworks with uh, applications that you'll be working on. So, so there's time frequency signal processing, there's transform theory, and there's detection and estimation theory and all these things. So these are all graduate level classes. Uh, so I know, I know you folks aren't thinking about graduate level classes right now, but I want to convince you that that's a, uh, something that you should be thinking about sooner than later. Okay? There are also, these are some uh, communications uh, graduate level courses. Uh, I, I, you have the handout, you can read it. If you have any questions about any of these courses in particular, I'll be, I can try to answer that. And, uh, there's also these special topics courses, so because ASU is, like I said, uh, we're hiring rapidly, so there are a lot of uh, young faculty, uh, not me, but uh, <laughs> who are coming in, I don't even know uh, most of the things, or you don't know what I know, which is, I'm like disqualified. But, so, 
we're hiring a lot of new folks who are experts in several areas, which means they, they teach sort of cutting edge topics courses in those areas. So uh, I, I've taught this course twice. I, I, in fact, I had a uh, couple of students who are in the, in the four plus one program that actually sat in my class. They really enjoyed it. So this is a, uh, a, a PhD upper level grad le course on machine learning, data science, and there's a whole bunch of things like that. So if, you want, if you're interested in networks or if you're interested in radar, there are advanced courses in all these areas. So uh, cool. And uh, as I run out of breath, uh, let, me, let me kind of tell you some more brass tacks about how, how we implement this pathway, right? So it's the the one nice thing is that we are, as faculty, we are constantly thinking about how, how to uh, update these courses so that it helps you folks uh, as you go into the market. And one thing that we have realized is that uh, more and more companies are asking for uh, beyond just a bachelor's, right? Which is, uh, which, uh, which is a trend that we have seen uh, uh, just broadly, and especially in this area. And the reason is that you, uh, this is one of those areas where you have to be kind of uh, good at math, and then you also have to be kind of a good engineer, and then you should be able to mash these things together so that you can build applications that are relevant. And uh, so there's a couple of options for this. So there is a four plus one program, which is a, as a undergrad, you should, you should talk to the experts in the back, so they are, they, they'll be able to help you out with the exact details. But we have a, a really cool four plus one program uh, I have had several four plus one program people in my uh, in my PhD level classes, and they are very competitive. And I think that uh, the advantage you have is that you're kind of already in the system, so you're already kind of uh, primed to deal with these uh, upper level classes. So as a master student, you can either do a thesis option where you get to work with the faculty and write a thesis and do some research, or there's an MSE option where you get a bunch of courses and get out in the, into the job market immediately. So bo both are interesting and viable options. And uh, of course, going beyond, you might want to do a PhD, and uh, that's a, a, a doctorate. And uh, this involves a, more research and a little bit more courses. So the, the, on the course side, it's not very demanding. It's, a, it's I, I guess, like 30 hours of courses, and you need like 18 hours of PhD level courses. But you also, uh, the advantage is that you get into the job market with a lot more pull, right? So I know that uh, one of my friends, he's a consultant at, uh, he's a consultant for one of these uh, data science startup in the Silicon Valley. So uh, these numbers you should, of course, modulate down because it's in Silicon Valley, right? But then uh, I know that he, he makes routinely offers to fresh PhD students, so just after, your, uh, after you get your degree, for uh, numbers that are insane. So there are something like $300,000 uh, uh, per year salaries, right? So, uh, so even, if the, even if money is not your thing, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so even if money is not your thing, uh, it, what, what it signals is the, the demand. So if someone is, if a, if a startup is willing to pay uh, so much money, maybe they, are, they have to figure out a way to spend all their seed money or something like that. But anyway, if, the, if a startup is willing to spend so much money on a fresh graduate student, that tells you how much in demand you are. So I would uh, really uh, encourage you to be mindful of this and design your kind of focus it's only a few years, right? It's not, you don't have to have a 10-year plan. So design your focus, focus over the next few years so that when you get out into the market, you have the skills that is required to get one of these very lucrative jobs. So, uh, so you can, uh, after your undergrad, you can theoretically get an MS and PhD in four years. And I know, I know some people who are really on track at ASU to do this, so to get very competitive PhDs. Uh, there's also the Dean's Fellowship. Again, I'll, for the details, I'll refer you to the experts in the room. But uh, uh, this is restricted to citizens, but the, the, the nice thing is that you get a full right. So you, you essentially, uh, you, you don't have to worry about a scholarship, but then you also get to, it's, it's something that goes on your CV that's very, very prestigious. So you should consider applying to that. Cool. Any questions? Yes? Or is there, is there a whole application process and competitive? So, so it requires faculty nomination. Right. Um, the baseline GPA is 3.5. It's competitive because it's across all of the schools. 
So right. if all of the 70 nominations are 4.0 and we have a bunch of 3.2, they will probably be given preference. We the higher the GPA, the better. Um, so faculty will nominate students for this when it's the semester before they're joining the graduate program, right. the PhD program. So, so you, you have an advantage in the sense that um, if you are thinking about it already, right, what, what uh, I would recommend is taking classes with faculty that y you think would, you would like working with and uh, impressing them. But also, if, if you have a strong nomination, that will go a long way. Because uh, if, you, if you're already doing like kick-ass research, then I think that will go a long way. So, so the G GPA is just one way to uh, measure people, but, but then uh, there are a whole bunch of other factors. But yeah, there is an application process. You would, uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would recommend, if you're seriously thinking about this, to get, uh, get, try to start working with the faculty. And, and uh, the, the nice thing about ASU is a whole bunch of people I'm always looking for uh, smart kids, right, and kids. Uh, but uh, so uh, I'm always looking for people who are interested, motivated. So there are several others like me who would love to work with folks like you. So, so uh, be proactive. And it, 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 it could be scary. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I, I used to be very uh, reticent about reaching out to professors. But I mean, uh, you shouldn't be. What are you going to lose, right? Uh, maybe you don't get a reply back to an email. Who cares? So, so uh, email people, show up to office hours, uh, show up at classes, do well, and that'll, that'll be a good way to kind of get on this program. Okay, so uh, take away. Uh, I'll leave this up, I'll have, uh, we'll have more questions. Uh, but there are, uh, I hope, hopefully I've convinced you that there are several cool applications to signal processing and communications and data science. Uh, it's, def it's really the, the, the right time to specialize in this area. And uh, this won't last. Uh, this is uh, uh, the truth about the world, right? Nothing lasts. But uh, well, that, got, that got dark. But, <laughs> so, but, but, the, but this is uh, particularly opportune, right? So this is essentially we are in, a, in an extremely nice, uh, uh, nice kind of co configuration for specializing in this area. And uh, are there math geeks here, people who like math? Oh. Okay, okay, so, so really, uh, I'm gonna say this, it's recorded, okay, um, it's fine, I'll say it. So, I'm a, I'm a math nerd, right, and I'm just, I just call it engineering so that I get the money. <laughs> so, so you get to do, you get to do really cool, really cool math, really advanced math, but then also, but it's also a lot more satisfying, so you're not working on stuff that nobody reads, you're, you're building things that people care about. So it's like a, a, a best of both worlds. So if you, if you like math, uh, I, I would even, yeah, I would even claim that this is one of the best areas to specialize in because you get to do both things. And of course, if you're a, if you're a hands-on engineer, you have a whole bunch of other things to work on. So I'll leave this up here and I'll take more questions. Thank you already for all the questions, but we can take more questions now. Cool. More questions? Yes. Project you worked on when you were an uh, undergraduate student? When I was an undergraduate student. So, uh, that's interesting. So, uh, I built my own. So, I did the, the fun stuff like building robots uh, that uh, were following lines and things like that. It used to be in a time when these things you can't just buy off uh, uh, of Amazon. Uh, there was no Amazon. No. This, uh, I'm making this worse for me. So, um, I know the renegade dance. No, I'm kidding. So, okay. So, uh, uh, so, I did this stuff, but one of the most coolest things that I did, which actually convinced me that signal processing was very interesting, is I built a, a compression algorithm. Okay, so this seems very, very abstract, but imagine that. So your, uh, your phone camera right now is, I don't know, 14 megapixels. And what that means is that it's picking up 14 million, uh, 14 million numbers for each image it's capturing, right? So, so these things are, uh, are massive objects. But then if you want to store them in your phone, if you store all those 14 million numbers, that's gonna, uh, your phone is going to run out of capacity immediately. So you can f store like three pictures at full resolution and your phone will be done, right? So it turns out that the reason why we still have really good looking pictures is because we can take what's captured and compress them into much smaller sizes and still have the same quality. So, 
So that was the funnest thing I did. I actually built my own compression algorithm. And you would learn things like that in an information theory class, which is in your, in your graduate level thing. So, so that was one of, the, one of the fun things that I did. I also built uh, some voice activated automation around the house, which is fun. So these, these, these things are uh, a lot of fun, especially uh, I had a, a, uh, a senior design project last semester, uh, the, the semester before this, where uh, this kid, he had a problem. He had a problem that he had both cats and dogs. So people have pets here. OK, so apparently the dog was constantly eating the cat's uh, food. I don't know how this works. Does, does this happen? OK, OK, so so uh, so he was thinking about for for a senior design project, they were working on some stuff which seemed very abstract. And then I said, we should just build a AI enabled face detection based pet feeder. Right. And they built it. So they actually uh, they, they mounted a camera. They built an algorithm that would detect a cat versus a dog and especially his cat versus uh, all the other things. And uh, so. It, it uh, only when the cat comes uh, uh, in front of the pet feeder with the door open and the the, the feed the food will fall into the plate. So, so these so these things are things that you can do, right? Like there are uh, a lot of cool things. I mean, of course, uh, uh, it's also become a lot easier to start companies right now. It's a it's a, it's a startup world. You have a whole bunch of opportunities to take ideas and prototype and immediately go to market. So I think that. Uh, yeah, so these are things that you can work on, and uh, there's a lot of support in the department for things like this. So you should constantly keep ta talking to faculty who are interested in stuff like this. More questions? So uh, just, uh, uh, is everybody here a junior, uh, freshman, or what, what, what's the? Raise your hand for freshman. Yeah, freshman. First year okay. students, First year, okay. So Sophomores, okay. okay, mostly sophomores, Seniors. juniors. Ooh, -hoo. see, you've done this before. Okay. How many people do things? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's cool. So this this is a good time to start thinking about this stuff. And uh, like I said, uh, several people have their doors open, uh, but even if not the doors, their emails are open. So feel free to reach out to us, get some pizza, and I'll be around for more questions. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.